Okay, everybody. Uh, today we will talk about the visual system. Visual system is an important special sense. Other special senses are, you know, that audition or hearing, olfaction or smelling, castration or tasting, those are special senses. Vision is processed in the visual system. So, visual system processes the sight. First, we will see the parts of the visual system. As you know, I have mentioned before, all sensory systems have two parts, peripheral part and central part. First, we will talk about the peripheral organs of the visual system. Peripheral organs are eyes. So we will see the structure of the eye, anatomy of the eye. If you see inside the eye you have chambers. So we will see what are the chambers inside the eye and the layers in the wall of the eyeball. There are three layers in the wall of the eyeball. We will see what are those three layers. Extraocular muscles, also called extrinsic eye muscles. Those are the muscles get attached to the outer surface of the eyeball and help in the movement of the eyeball. Those muscles come from outside, from around the eyeball and get attached to the eyeball and help in the movement of the eyeball. Can I pick it up? Uh, um, okay, so extrinsic or extraocular eye muscles. Then we will talk about the regulation of light. How the amount of light that enters into your eye is controlled or regulated. Then we will talk about the most important part of the eye, which is the retina of the eye. Why this is the most important part? Because the receptor cells are located in the retina. Visual receptors are located in the retina of the eye. That's why this is the most important part. There are different types of cells in the retina. We will see what are those different types of cells present in the retina of the eye. Two <coughs> types of cells are called the light sensitive cells, rods and cones. We will talk about the rods and cones and their functions. Then we will talk about the visual pathway, how the signal goes from the retina of the eye to the brain, to the visual cortex. That is the pathway of visual signal. Okay? So those are the things we will talk. First, the visual system has a central part and a peripheral part. Peripheral part consists of two eyes. In each eye, you have a number of structures. You have a eyeball, you have eyebrow, eyelids, conjunctiva, lacrimal apparatus, and extrinsic eye muscles. If you see the eye from outside, only a part 
of the eyeball you can see only the front part of the eyeball you can see from outside you can see other structures you can see eyebrow eyelids eyelashes um, those structures and you can see the cornea of the eyeball which is the transparent part in the front of the eyeball like a thin glass you can also see the iris that colorful part and inside the iris that dark hole is called the pupil that's an aperture or opening inside the iris and that white part around the iris or cornea is called the sclera so those are the parts of the eyeball you can see from outside there are six extrinsic eye muscles or extraocular muscles come from outside and get attached to the eyeball from outside and they help in the movement of the eyeball in different directions what are those six muscles four of them are rectus you see if this is the eyeball rectus means going straight okay superior rectus inferior rectus lateral rectus <coughs> medial rectus if this is your right eyeball this is the lateral rectus this is the medial rectus superior rectus and inferior rectus straight okay and two oblique muscles like this superior oblique inferior oblique okay now you tell me if i ask you which muscle will help to move the eyeball upwards superior rectus makes sense superior rectus to move the eyeball downwards inferior rectus makes sense laterally lateral rectus medially medial rectus now which muscles will help to rotate the eyeball obliques makes sense oblique muscles help to rotate the eyeball <coughs> now uh, here in this picture you see uh, those muscles extrinsic eye muscles are extra ocular muscles you don't see here medial because you are looking from the side you can see a little bit medial uh, over there this one okay so those are the extrinsic eye muscles now most of these muscles most of these muscles are controlled by the cranial nerve called the oculomotor oculo means what eye right oculo is eye motor is what movement so oculomotor its name is telling you the function oculomotor is the cranial nerve number 3 cranial nerve number 3 oculomotor controls four extrinsic muscles medial rectus superior rectus inferior rectus and inferior oblique those four muscles are controlled by the oculomotor now lateral rectus is controlled by abducens the cranial nerve number 6 and superior oblique is controlled by the trochlear nerve which is cranial nerve number 4 they need to remember these cranial nerves which one controls which extrinsic eye muscle okay structure of the eyeball the most important part of the eye is the eyeball if you see inside the eyeball there are two chambers anterior and posterior separated by the lens so in front of the lens you have the anterior chamber and behind the lens you have the posterior chamber so if this is the eyeball 
suspensory ligament. This is the lens. Okay. Here you have the cornea. Okay. Then iris. So this is the anterior chamber. This is the posterior chamber. This is the lens. Anterior chamber is filled with water-like fluid that is called aqueous humor. A A aqueous. Aqua means water. You know that. So anterior chamber is filled with water-like aqueous humor. Humor is fluid. The word humor means fluid. Posterior chamber is filled with jelly-like fluid. Or a structure that is called vitreous humor or vitreous body, jelly like fluid or jelly like structure that is vitreous humor or vitreous body. Now, uh, the fluid plays important roles. Because of the presence of fluid inside the eyeball, eyeball stays round. So, fluid gives the shape of the eyeball, which is very important. Fluid provides nutrition to the tissue. Number three, the Vitreous body or vitreous humor keeps the retina in place, in right place. Otherwise, if the amount of vitreous humor decreases or if it dries, gets dry, then what will happen? The retina will come off. Detachment of retina will occur. So, the vitreous humor keeps the retina in place. You know, sometimes we hear the term retinal detachment, right? That can happen uh, if the vitreous humor amount goes down. Wall of the eyeball. If you see the wall of the eyeball, it has three layers. Outermost most layer is called the fibrous layer. This layer forms two parts. Most of the part of fibrous layer is the sclera, about fifth, sixth part is sclera, the white covering of the eyeball. And only anterior one fifth part here <coughs> is transparent, like a thin glass, and that's the cornea. Cornea. Okay. So the entire thing, outer layer, is the fibrous layer. The whole outer covering is fibrous layer, right? And it has two parts. White part is called the sclera and transparent part in the front is called the cornea. One sixth. Okay, not one fifth, one sixth. So, middle layer is called the vascular layer. So, here the middle layer is called the vascular layer because a lot of capillaries are present in this layer. Okay. And in this vascular layer, you have few structures. This part, which is present in the back part of the eyeball, is called choroid. Choroid where you have many capillaries and the front part forms the ciliary body and the iris. You know iris is here, this is the pupil, the whole 
I wish with the muscle. So, this red structure is the middle layer, which is the vascular layer. In the back of the vascular layer, you have the choroid and in the front part of vascular layer, you have the ciliary body, iris, those structures, okay, iris and ciliary body. Okay, so choroid, ciliary body and iris, okay, so those are the parts of the middle layer, okay. Then innermost layer <coughs> is called the retina and it is only present in the posterior <coughs> part of the eyeball. So the innermost layer, this is the innermost layer, is the retina and retina is only present in the posterior part of the eyeball. This is the most important part of the eye or eyeball. Why? Because the receptor cells are located here, photoreceptors and other cells. Okay. <coughs> and this layer, retina, is called the sensory layer because different types of sensory receptor cells are present in this layer that I have mentioned, the sensory receptor cells, photoreceptor cells. That's why this layer is called the sensory layer. So, let's repeat again. Outermost layer of the wall of the eyeball is the fibrous layer. It has two parts. Sclera is the white part and cornea is the transparent part. Okay? Cornea allows the light to get in. Sclera stops the light. This is opaque. It will not let the light get in, which is very important. Just see that light should only enter through the cornea from the front. If light is allowed to get in through all directions, then what will happen? The light will go everywhere. But we want the light to fall on the center of the retina. So that's why only this part is transparent cornea will let the light get in that will fall on in the center of the retina otherwise light will go everywhere so that's why this part sclera is opaque and it <coughs> doesn't allow any light to get in then the middle layer is the vascular layer it forms choroid in the back ciliary body and iris in the front and innermost layer is the sensory layer which is the retina of the eye, only present in the back part of the eye. Okay? And the photoreceptors and other important cells are present in this layer. Okay. Now, uh, you see here those three layers in this picture. Now, how the light enters into the eyeball and falls on the retina. Which structures the light has to pass through? You already know that. First, the light has to pass through the cornea. And then, light has to pass through what? Right. What kind of fluid is here? <coughs> aqueous humor, right? Light has to pass through aqueous humor. Then, you have the opening here in the iris, that is the pupil, right? has to pass through the pupil and then pass through the lens. This is the lens and then <coughs> pass through the vitreous humor and then will reach at the retina, okay, reach to the retina. So, those are the structures the light has to pass through before it falls on the retina. <coughs> now, all those structures must be what? Transparent, right? Because light must be able to quickly pass through those structures. So, all those structures are transparent, highly transparent. Now, when the light passes through the cornea, the light gets slightly 
refracted, bent slightly, little bit. Refraction occurs. Refraction means bending. Okay. So when the light passes through the cornea, slightly, slight refraction or bending occurs. Little bit. And then when the light passes through the lens, lot of refraction occurs. Okay. More bending occurs. So these are the two structures where the light gets refracted or bent. Cornea and the lens. Cornea is called, therefore, cornea is called the fixed lens. Cornea is called a fixed lens. And the crystallized lens, this one, is called the flexible lens. Flexible. Because this one always changes the shape. Sometimes it gets more round, sometimes flat. So, this lens, which is the actual lens, is flexible. Not fixed. Okay? But the cornea is fixed there, right? It, it doesn't change. So, fixed lens and flexible lens. <coughs> uh, if you see the retina, the retina has the photoreceptors, rods and cones everywhere in the retina except the area where the optic nerve is attached. You see, uh, the optic nerve is attached to the area where the retina doesn't have rods and cones. And that's why that area is called the blind spot. Also, it is called the optic disc where <laughs> the optic nerve is attached and blood vessels <coughs> enter. In that area, the rods and cones are missing because you know blood vessels are entering through that area and optic nerve gets out. And that area is called the optic disc or blind spot because no rods, no cones there. No photosensitive or light sensitive cells. Okay, now if you see the retina of the eye, this is the retina of the eye, okay. This is the optic disc, optic nerve is attached and blood vessels. So, this is the optic uh, disc or blind spot okay, on the retina. Slightly away from the optic disc, you have an area that is called macula Lithia. Inside the macula lutea, you have a spot that is called the fovea, <coughs> also called fovea centralis, same thing, fovea or fovea centralis in the center. So, macula lutea and fovea centralis. Inside these structures, the cones are present in highest density. Highest number of cones are present in these areas. Okay. Highest number of cones or cones are present in maximum density. Very densely present the cones. Cones are also present in the center part of the retina. 
but in the macula lutea and fovea centralis, the cones are present in very high density. Now, the cones are the color sensitive cells, color sensitive photoreceptors. And there are three types of cones red, green, and blue. Red color sensitive, green color sensitive, and blue color sensitive cones. So, cones are three types. And cones are present in the center part of the retina and in highest density in the macula lutea and fovea centralis. The rods are present in the outer part of the retina. So, these are the rods, and rods are bigger in size and present in the outer part of the retina. So, these are the rods. <coughs> now, uh, the functions of cones. <coughs> cones are responsible for color vision <coughs> because Cones are color sensitive cells. Cones are responsible for visual acuity. You know what is visual acuity? The ability to see small. How small you can see. So, to see the things, very small things, you need the cones. And cones are responsible for daylight vision or bright light vision. To see with cones, you need bright light. Rods are responsible for dim light vision. In the dark, where the amount of light is low. So, in that condition, cones are used. To see the things in dark at night in dim light okay so those are the photoreceptors rods and cones <coughs> and their functions and their locations okay in the retina now to see the things in color and to see the things in small small things the light must fall here right make sense because the color sensitive cells are here and so if you want to see the things in color you must look straight so the light will fall here on the cones if you want to see something very small you must look straight when you read the book you look straight to read right if you won't see the small things in peripheral vision okay you have to straight look if you look straight the light will fall here if you look like this, light will go to the side <coughs> on the rocks. Make sense? Light will fall the outer part of the retina. And we know this trick. So people used to know these tricks uh, long ago. Although they didn't have any idea what is rods or cones, what are rods and cones. But you know, people used to see the stars at night. You know, using the peripheral vision. So, if you want to see the stars clearly, you should not look straight. If you look straight in the dark, you won't be able to see it. You will see better if you look a little bit off from that. So, the light will fall on the rods, outer part of the retina, if you look a little bit off. So, that's the trick to see the stars at night. <coughs> okay. Okay, now, iris. Iris is a round, flat muscle. And inside the iris, there is a hole or opening or aperture 
that is called the pupil. So pupil is basically nothing. It is a hole. And iris controls the size of the pupil. <coughs> and by controlling the size of the pupil, iris regulates or controls the amount of light enters into the eye. So, by controlling the size of the pupil, iris controls the light, entrance of the light. You see here two conditions. In the left, the pupil is constricted, small, and in the right side, dilated pupil. Pupil is very big. So, you see that iris can make the pupil very small or big. When you need to constrict the pupil? When? If you want more or less light enter. Less bright. If the light is bad, then you want to control the light, right? You want to reduce the amount of light that can enter. So, in bright light, if a lot of light falls on the eye, then the constriction of the pupil will occur. Make sense? That will reduce the amount of light enters. When the pupil should be dilated, when the light is less, right? So, your eye will try to take as much as light it can, right? In the dark, when you try to see something, your pupil should be dilated. Because you have less light, so you will want more light to enter into the eye. So, in the iris, you have two types of muscles, muscle fibers. In the inner part, you have the circular muscle fibers. And in the outer part, you have radial or longitudinal, same thing, muscle fibers. Okay, I did this say here. Uh, so, in the center part, you have the circular muscle fibers and in the outer part, you have radial or longitudinal fibers. So, this is the iris, this is the pupil and the circular muscle fibers in here and the radial or longitudinal muscle fibers like this. Okay, so if you want to constrict the pupil, make the pupil smaller, contraction of the circular muscle fibers will make the pupil small. When you want to dilate the pupil, what will happen? The contraction of the radial muscle fibers will pull the circular muscle fibers outwards. So, the size of the people will get bigger. Make sense? You are pulling from all different directions outwards. So, the people will get wider or bigger. So, that is the mechanism of constriction and dilation or dilatation of the people. <coughs> uh, parasympathetic stimulation constrict the People constricts the people. Sympathetic stimulation dilates the people. When you get scared, that is sympathetic stimulation, right? Excitement or scared um, that will dilate the people. When you are in comfortable condition, like you are lying on the bed and somebody is petting you like this, your eye people will get smaller. It will constrict, okay? And you know that is parasympathetic stimulation. <clears throat> okay. Now, the innermost layer, which is the sensory layer, retina. Retina is the most important structure. We have talked about it before. It has two layers, pigmented layer and neural layer. Pigmented layer is the outer layer of the retina and this layer absorbs light 
and prevents the scattering of the light. So by observing it quickly absorbs the light so the light will not be able to reflect or scatter. Quickly it will absorb the light, take the light inside in it. And also this layer stores vitamin A. Neural layer contains the photoreceptors, rods and cones. And also this layer has other cells. So photoreceptors, rods and cones and other cells. What are the other cells? Just remember the name. Bipolar cells, ganglion cells, hemocrine cells and horizontal cells. Those are the cells of the neural layer of the retina. Retinal cells. Rods and cones, those are called the photoreceptors and other cells are bipolar cells, hemocrine cells, ganglion cells and horizontal cells. Here you see two layers of the retina, pigmented and neural layer. <coughs> Here you see all those different types of cells in the neural layer of the retina. Photoreceptors, two types, rods and cones. You see the shape of cones are like cones, conical shape, kind of, uh, the yellow cells. And rods are like rod-like shape, <coughs> columnar. And then uh, from rods and cones, the bipolar cells receive the signal. And from the bipolar cell, the horizontal cells, hemocrine cells, they take the signal and give to the, finally, the signal goes to the ganglion cells. That is important from rods and cones. Just know that bipolar, horizontal, hemocrine, those cells take the signal to the ganglion cells. And the axons of ganglion cells, those are all neuron type cells. So the axons of ganglion cells bundle together and get out from the eyeball as the optic nerve. So optic nerve is nothing but a bundle of the axons of ganglion cells. All the axons of ganglion cells are bundled together to form the optic nerve and that gets out from the eyeball, takes the signal out from the eyeball. Here uh, you see the real photo of the retina, real picture of the retina. You can actually easily take the picture of the retina. Uh, when you go to the eye doctor, you will see they will put a drop to dilate the pupil, right? So that drop will dilate the pupil a lot. And now you can take the picture because you can look all the way back of the eye and take a picture of the retina. And this is the picture of a retina. Now you see the optic disc area, there is no rods or cones. That is the blind spot. And where the rods and uh, the, 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 in the middle of the retina, the macula lutea, where you have the cones in highest density, very densely present. That's why that area is the darkest. And in other areas, in the outer part, you have rods more and in the center part, you have cones more. Lens. Lens is very important because it focuses the light exactly on the retina. That is the function of the lens, focusing the light exactly on the retina. If the light is not focused on the retina, you won't see clearly. Okay, so that is very important. Now, <coughs> see if this is, I'm drawing the eyeball again. 
Okay, so this is the eyeball, this is the cornea, and this is the lens. Okay, and here you have the retina. The retina is in the back. So the lens refracts the light to focus the light exactly on the retina. And that is very important. If the light is not focused on the retina, for example, if the light is focused here, the front of the retina or behind the retina, you won't see clearly. Okay? Yes. Isn't that what uh, Right, right. So, uh, that is farsightedness and uh, the, uh, the nearsightedness. Okay. Okay, uh, we'll talk about that. So, just know that the lens must be able to focus the light exactly on the retina. And you will clearly see if it is focused exactly on the retina. If it is in front or behind, you won't see clearly. And you know, sometimes the lens fails may not be able to do that, right? And in that case, you have to use the glasses. If the light is focused here, okay, you have to do what? You have to push it back, right? To put here. And that's why we use one type of lens. If the light meets here, focused here, then what you have to do? You have to move it forward, right? So that's why we use two different types of lens. One can bring the focus forward, another can push the focus backwards, okay? So we can use round or convex lens or concave lens. Concave lens will do what? Will push the light focus backwards here, okay? So concave lens pushes it backward, that is concave lens in your eyeglasses, okay? Convex lens does what? Moves it forward, okay? So to move it forward, you need convex to push it backwards, you need, sorry, uh, it should be here because in this case, you want to push it back, right? So, okay. Right? From here to here, push backwards, that is the concave. To bring it forward, you want the convex lens because convex lens does this and concave lens does this. Okay? So, that's why we use the lenses to put the focus exactly or bring the focus exactly on the retina. <clears throat> okay, now um, this condition is called myopia and this is called hyperopia. Okay. When the light is in front of the retina, that is myopia, and when it is focused in the back, that is hyperopia. So, in case of hyperopia, you have to bring it here, from here to here, using convex lens. Make sense? In case of myopia, you have to push it backwards, okay, using the concave lens. <coughs> Myopia is also called near sightedness, the ability to see the near things, near sightedness, the ability to see the near things clearly, but the problem is where to see the far things, right? Hyperopia is the farsightedness. The person can see the far things clearly but has problem in seeing the near things like reading. Okay, That is hyperopia. 
<coughs> cataract is a condition that is also known as the cloudiness of the lens. The lens must be very transparent because light must be able to pass through the lens without any distortion, without any distortion. Clear should be able to pass through. But sometimes the lens may get cloudy and that is called cataract. What can cause that? There are some factors that <coughs> can cause the cataract. Uh, so far we know one is aging when we get old, diabetes mellitus, heavy smoking and frequent exposure to intense sunlight without sunglasses if you go to bright light for long term. Uh, here you see the cataract um, lens. The lens is not clear. There is cloudiness in the lens, right? Myopia, we have already talked about this. Hyperopia, nearsightedness, the ability to see the near things. Farsightedness, the ability to see the far things. A problem in near things. Astigmatism is a condition, it is more complicated situation where the lens or cornea is uneven in multiple locations, the cornea or lens is uneven. So the light will not be focused perfectly. Here you see the normal condition that is called emetropic eye, normal eye. The light is focused exactly on the retina by the lens. Lens is good. It is very flexible. So, it can focus the light exactly on the retina. <coughs> Here, you see the condition where the light has been focused in front of the retina, not on the retina. What can cause that? One is, if the lens loses the flexibility, that can cause it. Another is, if the shape of the eyeball changes. See here, this is the normal shape of the eyeball. If, for any reason, your eyeball gets more elongated, Your lens doesn't know that. Lens will try to focus here. But actually, your lens has moved further away because the eyeball got longer, elongated. So, lens has moved from here to here. But the, uh, sorry, the retina has moved from here to here. So, the lens will focus the light here, but it should be actually on the retina. So, that is another reason of myopic eye. The shape of the eyeball gets elongated. Uh, what can cause that? One common cause is when the kids at puberty, suddenly the body grows. You know, know that, right? But what happens? The eyeball is soft tissue organ. Eyeball grows faster than the bones, orbital fossa. So, orbital fossa will grow slowly, but eyeball will grow faster. So, what will happen? The pressure will fall on the eyeball, right? And that will make the eyeball elongated. So, the lens will move further backwards. And that's why we see often uh, that kids, when they start to grow uh, <coughs> before or during puberty, they need the glasses. They complain the myopia. myopia. Using concave lens, you can fix that problem that I have mentioned here. This is hyperopia. The focus is behind the retina, so you have to bring it back on the retina by using convex lens. 
that will convert the light more. Okay, the visual pathway. I have already mentioned that the bundle of axons of ganglion cells form the optic nerve and that gets out from the eyeball. Optic nerve is cranial nerve number 2. You can write it down. Cranial nerve number 2 is the <coughs> optic nerve. <coughs> optic nerves, two optic nerves meet at the optic chiasma. You already know. You have seen <coughs> when you did the dissection. Optic chiasma where most of the fibers will cross will go to the opposite side but many fibers will stay in the same side so some crossover of fibers will take place many fibers will go to the opposite side like this cross but many fibers will also stay in the same side it is like this so this is one optic nerve but it's coming green Okay. This is another optic nerve, right? These are the axons of ganglion cells. Uh, most of the fibers will go to the opposite side, but many fibers will stay in the same side. Like this. Stay in the same side too. So, crossover will take place here. And that is very important. So, your both sides of the brain both hemispheres will get signal from both eyes okay, to cover the entire visual field. Then after the optic chiasma, so these are optic nerves, optic chiasma is the place where they meet and then again the fibers bundle and form optic tracts. So these are the optic tracts, optic nerves, chiasma, optic tracts. And optic tracts take the signal to the lateral geniculate body of the thalamus. You know that thalamus is the major sensory relay station. So, we will go to the thalamus and from the thalamus, the fibers will go to the visual cortex. Okay? From the thalamus, the fibers will go to the visual cortex. So, you have thalamus here. thalamus and from here the fibers will go to the visual cortex in the back of the occipital lobe lobe you already know that is the visual cortex visual cortex from here the visual cortex and these fibers that take the signal from the thalamus to the visual cortex these are called optic radiation optic radiation okay so that is the main pathway from the eyeballs optic nerves optic chiasma optic tracts thalamus and the primary visual cortex in the back of the occipital lobe now uh, before the optic tract fibers enter into the thalamus some fibers can go to other structures. Superior colliculi. How many of you remember superior colliculi? Have you heard the name? Superior colliculi? Inferior colliculi? <laughs> Have you seen in the brain? Yes or no? Have you seen corpora quadrigemina? Four round structures I showed you. So superior are bigger, right? And they receive the visual signal. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> some fibers will go to the midbrain. So, midbrain and superior colliculus will get some fibers. But most of them will go to the thalamus and to the visual cortex. Uh, do you have any question? Yeah. So, the superior colliculi, that's for reflexes? What yeah. happens in the midbrain? Yes, uh, both are for the reflexes and eye movement. And the 
thalamus and visual cortex is to see okay uh, those are that pathway is to see the picture vision but you know when you see something like you are uh, when i am moving this one you are looking you are seeing the picture of it but at the same time you are following it right your eye is moving so this pathway you see this pathway is only to do what see it. see it it has nothing to do with the movement but you must be able to move the eye right so these fibers from here and here the signal will go to extrinsic eye muscles extraocular muscles to move the eyeball make sense so both are important because when you see you have to move the eye when you you want to follow something so that's why some fibers go to superior collicular midbrain and will help you to control the movement of the eye. Yes. And the way you drew it, it looks like there's two thalamuses and two visual cortex, but they actually come together. No, no, there are two thalamus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, sorry, the thalamus is only one. Yeah, you're right. There are two visual cortexes. Yeah, two visual cortexes. So it should actually go to one thalamus. Like then the visual cortex. Yeah. So like two there are inside the thalamus uh, the way the reason i have done it inside the thalamus you have the um, uh, nuclei for the vision audition you have separate nuclei so for visual you have two nuclei uh, lateral geniculate bodies okay there are two lateral geniculate bodies In the thalamus, there are two lateral geniculate bodies. Okay, here you see uh, the pathway I have already explained. From the eyeballs, uh, the optic nerves, then optic chiasma, where crossover of some fibers take place, and also some fibers will stay in the same side and will form. The bundles again the optic tracts and then the optic tract fibers will enter into the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus okay so there are two lateral geniculate nucleus in two sides and from there the optic radiation fibers take the signal to the primary visual cortex in the back of the occipital look just know that pathway Visual depth perception, uh, I did a lot of research, uh, probably some of you attended in my 3D lecture, right? did you, anybody from this class, yeah. So uh, the most important cue for visual depth perception is the binocular disparity. Why you have two eyes, not one, why all the creatures? have two eyes because when you see something your right and left eyes see the thing in slightly different locations right you can just put your finger like this and open and close your right and left eye try to do that uh, you, you will see that your finger is moving like this why is that because your left eye sees it in one location your right eye sees it in different location that's why it moves when you close and open your right and left eye. And that is called the binocular disparity, the difference between the right and left eye. And that information your brain needs, your brain needs that information to give you the perception of 3D, the distance or the shape, all those are given by 3D. And your uh, binocular disparity from the eye um, goes to the brain and your brain processes the 3D. Everything falls on the retina, although you see the things in 3D, everything is taken on the retina as picture, 2D picture. When you take the picture on the camera, 2D, right? Everything is captured by the retina as 2D, flat but in slightly different location and that your brain needs to reconstruct the 3D vision, okay, which is very important. And you uh, can easily 
test that you need two eyes instead of one to um, measure the distance or shape. Uh, you can try to drive using one eye, you will see the problem. You can, if I ask you to thread the needle using one eye, it will be very difficult, you won't be able to do that, okay? Put two sharp things together using one eye, you won't be able to do that. So, uh, that distance measurement is given by the disparity, and that disparity is very important. Okay, so uh, here you see we know that binocular disparity is important to see the things in 3D. That means your right and left eye, if your right and left eye see the things in different locations, then you see in 3D. Now you can create 3D on 2D surface and can trick the brain, can, can you know, uh, do some trick like you put two sets of dots on 2D surface and when you will look those two different sets of dots one set you will look with your right eye another set you will look with your left eye if I block one color uh, in your right eye and another in the left eye then your right eye will see one set of dot left eye will see another set of dot make sense because you are blocking one color and then the brain will get two sets of dots but from two different eyes in slightly different locations. Make sense? And then you didn't get that at all. Okay. So you see the middle part here. How many sets of dots? Two. Okay. Red and green or blue. Okay. Now if I give you a um, um, goggles, one is red, another is blue. Okay. So through this eye, you will only see the blue. Through this eye, you will only see the red, right? And you will see in slightly different locations, right? Two sets. That means what? Your brain is getting signal of one set of dot from right eye, another set of dot from left eye, right? And they are in sli same location or slightly different? Slightly different, right? So now you can trick the brain because brain can only, you know, measure the disparity. <laughs> and give you the perception of 3D. And now if I give you, uh, let me give you, if I give you a, a colors that has two different colors, and if you look through that, you can see that. Uh, looking in the middle. Yes. Can you see your eyes all look purple? Yeah. Is that kind of the same thing? Uh, yeah, if the color is distorted, <coughs> then it will get, you know, kind of distorted feeling. 